All right, ladies and gentlemen, we want to start this uh, semester off returning uh, to momentum. I know we did it somewhat at the end of last semester, but we also do want to hit it this semester. We skipped over a couple parts that are uh, quite important as we get ready for the AP test. Uh, so the first one is the idea of impulse, and that is a change in momentum. Last unit, or I'm sorry, last semester, we pretty much just said, hey, momentum is never going to change. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it can as long as there is some outside force. We just dealt with situations last semester where we didn't have any outside forces. So we could just say M1V1 plus M2V2 equals M1V1 plus M2V2. But this time we are going to work with a change in momentum. And it turns out that this is actually the original way that Isaac Newton wrote his second law. He said that a, a net force is equal to a change in momentum or a change in time. Now, we prefer uh, to use this equation, net force equals ma. But the fact of the matter is, uh, that is not the original way it's written, but we can get there from here. So whenever we have a change in momentum or a change in anything, really that means a final minus an initial. So I'm going to say that net force also equals uh, a final momentum minus initial momentum over a change in time. Take it one step further. And I'm going to say that a momentum final would just be whatever the mass of that object is times its velocity final minus mass times velocity initial over a change in time. And then we have to factor out that mass. We tend not to change our mass uh, from beginning to end. So I could say m uh, is vf minus v initial over a change in time. I'm going to work down here from it. And I'm going to rewrite that as delta v over delta t. And a change in velocity over a change in time is just acceleration. So we are home free. That is ma. So in fact, this is the exact same equation. It's just laid out a little bit differently. It focuses on different things. It focuses on a change in velocity instead of just calling that acceleration. Uh, and it involves time as well. Uh, we do use uh, the, I'm sorry, the unit of uh, the net force is in newtons, but a momentum change uh, is in units of either newton seconds excuse me, it's either in newton seconds or in kilogram meters per second. Whichever way you prefer to write that, both are correct. You should be able to recognize both of them as momentum units. So ultimately, the equation for this unit is going to be uh, the change in momentum is equal to net force times time. We also call this impulse, which is an odd thing to do. Uh, typically, for changes in some quantity, we just say the change in velocity or the change in acceleration or the change in time or the change in position. We tend not to give that its own special word. Uh, but for whatever reason, impulse is given uh, to that idea, to that change in momentum, that word impulse. And then to make it even weirder, we use the symbol J for impulse. Why? I don't know. Um, and I probably won't ever know because I don't care enough to look it up. But impulse is just another name for change in momentum. They mean the exact same thing. So this is a very redundant statement. Uh, and it has the same new units. It is still Newton seconds or kilogram meters per second. And again, here's that, uh, I think, derivation started for how that works out. But this is really what we're worried about. This is what we're going to use. Uh, not much else. Let me see what I got on the next slide. And one sort of one step further that we can take this. Instead of, let me say it this way, a lot of the times a problem is not going to give you the change in your momentum was x or y or z. Um, that's, that's too easy. So a lot of the times we're actually going to take this uh, equation and set it up more like this. We'll say uh, mass times velocity final minus mass times velocity initial equals net force times delta t. For a word problem, that is 
likely the most common way you'll have to use that equation. Uh, it is not going to give you, you know, the momentum final was this many kilogram meters per second. It's probably going to give you a mass and a velocity. It might even ask you for one of these velocities and give you the rest of the stuff. Uh, but this is the way it will get used. But just recognize that that is valid as well. It's the exact same equation. I just broke down this delta P. I broke it down into uh, momentum final minus momentum initial and then into mass times velocity minus mass times velocity. One of the cool things about uh, that equation is the time piece to it. I like that uh, part the best because it explains why we have airbags and uh, those landing bags that like stuntmen jump onto. Airbags do not actually change your change in momentum. They don't affect uh, your you know, how much velocity you are losing. You are coming to a stop regardless, uh, whether it is against pavement or against one of these sort of cushions, you will come to a stop. The difference is it changes the time of that collision. Instead of you uh, hitting against pavement in an almighty splat as you jump out of a window, if you jump on one of these landing bags, it actually makes that collision with the bag last longer than it would last if you had just jumped onto pavement. And because of that, uh, we end up with the exact same change in momentum, but without the bag, our, our time is very small. So to make this happen, we have to have a very large net force. But with the bag, it increases the time exponentially, and our net force is actually smaller. It's the net force that hurts, right? It's the fact that you uh, had that force applied to you. It's not the fact that you stopped. I can walk and then stop. That's not a problem. Um, I've, I've come up to stoplights from uh, going like 60 miles per hour plenty of times. Like it, Coming to a stop is not an issue. It's the fact that you're coming to a stop so darn fast uh, that is dangerous when you don't have those airbags. A large part of this is actually using graphs. We've got two types of graphs. They look extremely similar, but they are importantly different. Uh, the one on the left is a net force versus time graph. Whenever we take the integral or the area of a graph, we're doing the y-axis times the x-axis. Well, that's just net force times time. That's impulse. That's change in momentum. So if we have a net force times time graph uh, and we take the area, we get the impulse. But if we take the area of this other one, this net force distance graph, and we take those two axes, we multiply them together, we get net force times distance, that's net work, and that is the exact same thing as a change in kinetic energy. These are similar ideas. Well, they're both talking about changes in momentum, like how much different could it really be? Uh, one is a vector, one is a scalar. And that's the real importance. If the area, uh, it says down below, if the area of the net force versus time graph becomes negative, then the momentum is changing in the negative direction. We have a negative net force. It means we are losing momentum uh, maybe to the right, which means that we are slowing down. Uh, but after some point, if we slow down enough, we'll stop and then start speeding up in the negative direction. Right? If we have... We, if we keep gaining enough negative momentum to cancel out all of the positive momentum, we get to zero. But if we keep gaining that, if we're still in the negative, you know, still going downward on that graph, or even if we flatlined underneath, if the area is still increasing under that graph, uh, we s must switch directions. We switch directions, and then we start speeding up. Because once we're moving in the negative direction and we gain momentum in the negative direction, that is speeding up. On the other hand, uh, our kinetic energy graph, there is a limit to how much energy you can lose, right? There's a bottom limit, zero. You can't have less energy than zero. So if this graph uh, continued down, and let's say uh, that as it continued down, the area is completely balanced and we got to a point where no energy uh, existed, like we lost all of our energy. That This whole way, this must mean slowing down. We can't switch directions with this energy. Once we hit that zero point, 
this graph has to come straight up and then be at zero until we gain some energy. You can't have negative energy, right? Uh, you can't be going slower than zero meters per second. You can go in the negative direction, but that's not the same thing as actually a negative number like we think about in math class. Here's a little sample problem. Uh, if we take the area of this graph all the times we do that, we just uh, separate it into two separate chunks, right? We separate it into this nice square shape, and then we also have this triangle over here. So we get the individual areas of each one of those using either base times height or one half base times height. Add them together. Uh, if we add one that might be underneath of this x-axis, we would end up subtracting that area because it is negative. Uh, that integral is negative. So we get a change in momentum that is 150 kilogram meters per second in the positive direction. But uh, the question didn't ask us for that. The question didn't say how much momentum did it change. It said what speed will it have after 15 seconds. So it wanted the speed after this momentum change. So we're going to break down a change in momentum to be equal to uh, the momentum final minus the momentum initial. Rearrange it so that we get momentum final at the end by itself. We're looking for a final velocity, which means that that side has to be all by its lonesome. It said, uh, you know, we got our final, or I'm sorry, our change in momentum. So we plugged that guy in. Uh, but in the problem, it said some stuff about the initial condition. So we plug those in. So we get our final momentum as 70 kilogram meters per second. And then we say that the mass times the velocity final equals 70. And doing some more algebra, we get 3.5 meters per second in the positive direction as our final velocity. A common problem that people will have will be stopping right here. They'll say, oh, I need to find the change in momentum like to start the problem. And they'll do it. And then they'll be like, I'm done. I feel good about myself. Uh, the problem is that you didn't answer what the question asked. If, I'm sorry, if the object had some initial momentum. By just finding the integral, you did not find the final momentum. You found the change. You found out how much it gained, not how much it ended up with. A couple more little sample problems. And then uh, in our day two uh, of instruction, we talked a little bit about center of mass. And this is um, a topic that sort of bridges the gap a little bit between this unit and the next unit, uh, or one of the next units, which is rotational motion. Uh, and it turns out um, that I've been lying to you for the most of the semester, or most of the year, and objects don't actually orbit other objects. Uh, the Earth does not actually orbit the sun and the moon does not actually orbit the Earth. What the moon and the Earth orbit are what are called centers of mass. And that is essentially um, an average mass, maybe not an average mass, it's the location of the average mass. If we took all of the masses in a system into consideration, like let's say um, that we had this mass and this mass and this mass, the center of mass is somewhere in between all of them. It's like an average. A little football there. So nice. It uh, takes into account how much mass is in each position and where it is located and sort of balances them against each other. And we'll see an equation to do that mathematically on the next slide. But with the Earth and the Moon, we'll say first. It turns out that the Moon is big enough that it actually pulls the center of mass outside of where the Earth actually is. It's not perfectly centered on the Earth. It's a little bit offset. Um, and because of that, the Earth also orbits around that center of mass. So like, let's say here uh, was the Earth, the center of mass is off to one side. So it actually sort of spins against itself. So instead of just being sort of that shape, and here's that center of mass over there, as it goes through the universe, it's actually turning along that axis. It's not perfectly rotating on its center. It's rotating off its center a little bit. And this is what people are talking about uh, if they say that the Earth is wobbling a little bit, that the Earth has some wobble to it. 
it's because the moon causes that center of mass to be a little bit offset and it causes it to spin not exactly on its perfect uh, axis. The same is true with uh, multiple star systems, um, like you see right here. If there are two stars of relatively the same mass or close to their masses, uh, they orbit each other. They both spin around some center of mass, like this one here. Um, the case is true uh, for Sirius A and Sirius B. It's a two-star system, and they actually use this idea to find Sirius B. Uh, by looking at this wobble, they were able to detect this wobble in Sirius A, which is much, 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 much brighter than Sirius B. So bright, it's actually the brightest star in the sky with the exception of the sun, and that's only because uh, the sun is so close. Sirius B is so bright that with Sirius B so close to it, um, scientists could not detect it. They couldn't pick out uh, its, its light rays or its light uh, from there, so it just like looked like one big splotch from Sirius A. But they noticed that Sirius A was doing this wobble pattern, and they they tracked it over, uh, you know, decades to see this. But they noticed that it was happening, and because it happened, they knew there must be some other large mass out there, so large um, that they knew it had to be a second sun. There was no way it was a planet if that was the case. And this is also how they found what are called hot Jupiters. Uh, hot Jupiters are planets that orbit uh, really close to the sun. So like, let's say here's our sun. Uh, a hot Jupiter would be like this big compared to that sun and it would be right near the surface. And it orbits uh, in a time of about four hours. Well, because it's so close and because it has such a large mass, Jupiter's a rather large planet, and these are about the same. They're gigantic planets that are extremely close to that sun. Because they're so close and they have such a large mass, they all actually cause wobbles to occur to these suns by themselves, and that's somehow they found the first exoplanets uh, were hot Jupiters. They noticed these wobbles uh, happening to the sun as it orbits, as its center of mass uh, was actually outside of that center. Typically, uh, the suns are so much bigger than anything that are orbiting them that they stay relatively in their position. But in fact, our own sun can actually wobble a little bit if we align all of the planets on one side of it. Uh, if all There's a couple occasions where all of the planets will get to sort of one side of the sun and it will cause it to wobble. So this uh, center of mass is also known as balance point, sort of on a smaller scale than, uh, than planets um, in your everyday life. It's the balance point. So if you try to balance something, maybe your pen or your pencil on your finger, uh, wherever you get it to balance at is its center of mass. If you put your finger under it and let it just hang there, that is the center of mass. It's also known as axis of rotation. And that's what we'll really get into in that unit about rotational motion. Um, but let's say we had a hammer, and if we threw that hammer, uh, the handle would spin around the head as it went through the air. The head would move relatively regularly, actually in a perfect parabola as if it was in uh, projectile motion, as you can kind of see there. But the handle uh, spins about that point. The handle doesn't move. If you just looked at the handle, it doesn't move in this projectile motion. Uh, and that is because it is rotating around the center of mass. It's the center of mass that moves in the parabola. If we treat everything as its center of mass, that's really what we've been doing up to this point in the class. We've treated everything just as its center of mass. It makes the calculations a lot easier. We just call everything some point. Uh, we don't treat it as a whole object necessarily. But we will. We end up. We will end up doing that uh, with something called moment of inertia. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, the same is true with your water bottle flipping. If you're one of those people, uh, if you flip a water bottle, uh, the water is actually the heaviest part of that system. So that water is what actually moves in a parabola, and the bottle kind of spins around it, uh, which is kind of interesting to watch, I guess. So this is the equation to calculate where a center of mass is. Now, we'll only do it in one dimension, uh, which makes it easier. And this is the equation, this top one here, uh, is the one that it will be more commonly actually used. The bottom one is just kind of math shorthand. But what it says is that the uh, position of the center of mass 
the position, and I just put subscript COM for center of mass, is equal to the sum of each individual object's position times its mass. So if I take the position uh, times the mass of my first object, and then I do the same for my second object, and my third object, and my fourth object, however many objects I have, I can do this with an infinite number of objects. If I do that, and then I divide it by the sum of all the masses, that gets me a position where the center of mass is located. So if all of you were sitting uh, in the classroom, we could do this. If I got, you know, we could find the center of mass between uh, all of us individuals. And I could get each one of your masses, and we could set the exact middle of the room as sort of our zero point. We could do all the calculations. Um, and one of the things is that bigger people like me uh, sort of pull more weight. It's kind of like a test grade in classes that have weighted grades. Uh, they say that it's going to have more weight. This is the same way that uh, the gradebook systems calculate your uh, grade. Let's say that a test was 70% of your grade. It would say 0.7 times uh, whatever percent you had there. And then it would say 0.3 uh, times whatever grade you got in there. It would weight them that way. It would say that the sort of mass of that test uh, score is 0.7 and the mass of the homework grade is 0.3. It's kind of interesting. So we did a sample problem here. To find the center of mass here, uh, I'm going to say that, and I'll change it for those of you who are watching again who are in class. I'll change these numbers up real quick. Uh, let's say we had a mass of 7 kilograms, and we had a mass of 21 kilograms for our mass 2. And we want to know if both of these objects, I'll say one is located at negative uh, 2, the other is located at 7. Yeah, we'll do it that way. One is located at negative 2, one is located at 7. So I want to know where my center of mass is. So I'm going to say, all right, uh, the position for my center of mass is equal to the position of my first object. So the position here is negative 2. i got to include the negative times its mass, plus my position of uh, object 2, which was 7, times 21 for its mass. And that is all over 28. So I've got 100 and, I think, 47 minus 14 over 28. That's the total mass here. That's 7 uh, plus 21. So 133 divided by 28. Let's see, 133 divided by 28. And that gets me 4.75. So my center of mass is actually right about there. And it makes sense that it's closer to my larger mass because it's that mass is larger. It pulls more weight. It, it affects the center of mass more. In fact, it is three times bigger than my mass one. So the distance here has to be three times what this distance is. So we end up with two and a quarter. So we get two, four, six point seven five as the distance. So if our mass is three times bigger, the distance to the center of mass has to be three times smaller. And we can do more calculations with those, and we can use uh, speed. But the idea, it, the sort of follow-up idea in where we tied in uh, our, excuse me, where we tied in linear momentum to this, and where we got sort of back to collisions, was that, let's say that this block, and I'm going to was what I actually needed. Let's get rid of all this. Get them out of there. Let's say that uh, I'm going to reset these. Oops. Easy. I'm going to reset some of these. So this mass is still going to be 7 kilograms. Um, and I'll set him... Actually, I'll leave him at the negative 2. So that this center of mass is... Uh, we said it was 4.75 
And I'll say that each one of these sort of hash marks are meters. So I'm going to say that this object, let's say it might be uh, a, a small truck. Seven kilograms is very, very small. Uh, but it, it's some object that uh, we're going to say that it's actually moving with a velocity of three meters per second. So that moves with a velocity of three meters per second. And I'm going to have it go uh, for 1.5 seconds. So if this object uh, goes at a velocity of 3 meters per second for 1.5 seconds, that means that it covered 4.5 meters in that time. So now, instead of being here, my object actually moved 4.5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 0.5. But now, because that object has moved, my center of mass has to have also moved. So this is no longer true. Uh, it started off at 4.75, but now we have to recalculate it. So I'll do that real quick. I'll say uh, 2.5 times that mass of 7.5. I'm sorry, it's just 7, not 7.5. Plus uh, 7 is our position for our second object, and it has a mass of 21. And we have to divide all of that by the total mass of 28. So 2.5 times uh, 7, so that's for my first object, plus 7 times 21. Uh, gets me 164.5 divided by 28, and I'm getting 5.875 as my position uh, now for my center of mass. So 5.875, that's about right there. So then the question is, if this object moved at 3 meters per second, like we said, what was the speed of my center of mass? And speed is a change in position over time, or a distance over time. So during that 2 sec, I'm sorry, 1.5 second time period, uh, my object moved from 4.75 to 5.875, uh, which, let me see, is a distance of 1.125 meters in one and a half seconds. So my speed was 7.5, I'm sorry, not 7.5, 0.75 meters per second. And it turns out that that speed of the center of mass is the exact same speed as if we had collided these two objects and they stuck together and kept moving. When we talk about uh, the conservation of linear momentum like we did uh, before the semester ended last, uh, last semester, we said that the momentum of the system has to be equal before and after a collision. Well, if we just look at the velocity of the center of mass and the center of mass being some combination of all of the masses, uh, that's really like the momentum of the whole system if we took those together. So if those two things hit and collide, that is an internal force, not an external force, not a net force. So because of that, we can't change the speed of our center of mass. We can't change the system's total momentum. This is just a different way of thinking about uh, this equation here, m1v1 plus m2v2 equals m1v1 plus m2v2. This is what we saw last unit. Uh, but if we think about it in terms of the center of mass, it's the exact same thing. A closed system must keep the same momentum. And the momentum for the entire system all put together in one piece is just going to be our center of mass value, uh, that, that total mass over, you know, how fast, it's how fast it was moving. Let me rephrase that because that got all jumbled. It is the velocity that it moves with the set that the center of mass moves with has to be the exact same as the velocity that all the pieces, if we smush them together into one, would move with. In fact, if we didn't even smush them together into one, if those two objects had bounced apart from each other, that center of mass would continue to move 
at 0.75 meters per second. The individual pieces can move at different speeds, but when combined into a center of mass, a sort of one point where that mass resides, the velocity has to remain the same. It can't change just because it bumped into something that was part of itself. Because those two objects are part of that system. Now, if I came by and I just smacked one of those objects away, yeah, we're going to see a change in total momentum. We're going to see that uh, the speed or the velocity of that center of mass would have changed. But that's because I'm an outside force. Just bumping into yourself does not cause you to move. Bumping into something else causes something to move. And that takes care of our impulse and our center of mass talk. Um, we're going to get back into conservation of momentum and review some of that stuff. Uh, but we're going to breeze through it because we already hit it last semester. Have a good one, everybody.